everyone. I've got some sunflower, sunflower <laughs> paintings that I've been working on all day. Just been having fun with these. I had this idea of giant sunflower trees, <laughs> which is what these have turned into. And I'm going to be doing another one right now. And if you'd like to pull out your brushes and hang out with me and do this, you're welcome to join in. Because I'm also going to tell you about a contest that Lindsay from Artistic Isle is sponsoring along with me and five other artists. A little mini <laughs> tin of watercolors along with some other goodies, which will include one of my original sunflower paintings when I decide which one, possibly this one I'm working on right now, which is a currently blank sheet of paper, but it's going to be, well, it is because it is active right now. It's a contest where you can enter by creating a sunflower painting and there will be six winners that will be picked, one by each of the participating artists and one by Lindsay. So start painting sunflowers. <laughs> you have until next weekend, I believe. All right, so I've got some new colors that I was planning to try out today. I haven't yet opened these even, so they're brand new. I've got this yellow. Let's see, what else am I going to use? I'm going to use some of the colors that she's sent me in the past. So I've got Scarlet Hematite as well. And this one is Venetian yellow, I think. Okay, let's put these all on here. What else do I have? This black, king black, is probably going to be useful. So let's open that one up. There's this sort of lavender color, a green, this orange, and a pinkish tone. I think I might use some of this green. And as always, if you have any questions about what I'm doing as I start painting, or about anything for me in general, Feel free to shoot those over the chat. Oh, that's cute. That's what these colors are. So there's Scottish Thistle, Meadow, meadow Green, Honey Blossom, Tiger Lily, and Snapdragon. <laughs> and what else do I have? A sea stone. It looks like this sort of metallic bronzy tone. Got it open. And a few other colors that will be needed. This one is olive. I love those muted greens. And thallo, turquoise, and squid ink. And one more. This one is, I'm not sure what that one is, but it's a dark blue. <laughs> So I think that is a good array of colors for what I'm going to be painting. And I have here my Moulin de Roy paper, hot press 300 pound cotton watercolor paper. So let's get started. 
I'll zoom in later as I go for finer detail things, but I think early on here we can stay zoomed out so you can see the color palette as well. Hello everyone joining just now. The paints that I'm using are Artistic Isle. She is on Instagram as well. I will link that to you right now. Let's see. I almost always use hot press. Every once in a while I, I play around with cold press. I was doing a little bit on some cold press paper here earlier. So this is Arches. This is Arches. Um, here it is. Cold press, cotton. And I did not like how the colors kind of sank into it much more. Uh, Moulin de Roy is my favorite, this is Canson. And the colors just were more vibrant on here, even though I, I put the same amount of pigment down and did it at the same time. Uh, I generally just prefer hot press. Especially for a lot of fine detail work that I do. All right, so start with some of this yellow. Such a happy color. Not really sure where I'm going to be going with this painting. Right now I'm just putting stuff on the page and then I'm just going to go with the flow. as always on my videos, <laughs> neighbor dogs in the background. <laughs> trying to mix this quickly. I probably should have mixed these beforehand, which is what I usually do if I'm going to need to work fast. Now this is one of those rare instances where I want my foreground things, colors, to bleed into the background area. Not a ton. So, I mean, I don't want all my yellow to become completely obliterated and turned into a greenish blend. But I do want a tiny bit to flow off the edges and intermingle and that's why I'm doing this now while it's still wet. But at the same time, I'm also making sure to not paint all the way up to my yellow. I'm leaving, I'm leaving some breather space of white paper. And you can see that all around the rim of these flowers. And that little rim acts as a buffer that allows for a much more varied texture. 
So if I were to just let everything blend together, it would be a much overall softer look. But this then allows for a little bit of a combination. You see in some areas where it's just completely mingling and mixing and others where it stays well behaved and in their own separate portions of the paper. I'm going to tilt that a little bit more so you don't get so much of the water glare. Okay, now the other thing I want to get in while it's still wet is some of the scarlet hematite in the center of the flowers. And again, I want to let it bloom just a little bit outward. Not so that it takes over the whole flower, but definitely so that I have a little bit of that feathery watercolor edge. Let's see, this one over here is a little bit dry, so it's not gonna really bleed out as much here. But that variation is nice. I like how on some of them it, re it really blooms out, and others, like on this one, it's more contained. a few splotches just completely into the wet. Now this is for contrast, you know, what I was just talking about where there's no boundary of white and so it's a much softer edge and it blends entirely into the blue. It just goes from the yellow into a greenish rim and then out into the blue because there's no white paper dry to buffer it and prevent the color from spreading out into that area. Betty Betty is asking, do I wet my paper first or do I prefer to just work on dry ground? It depends on the technique that I'm doing. So you see right now where this is, I'm doing wet and wet because I'm letting the yellow bloom outward. It definitely has to go onto a wet surface. Um, and if I'm trying to get a smooth background wash, then also I will sometimes wet the entire page first before I begin painting so that the, the paint can kind of spread within that zone. Uh, I'll do that also with botanical things where I'm laying down a base layer of color and I set, uh, so then I'll do a very, very pale light wash over the entire body of whatever it is I'm painting initially, usually like a petal or a leaf or a fruit, whatever it is. So I wet it first and then I, then I paint a, a light glaze into that. And that lets things kind of spread within the area. I'm going to dry this a little bit because it's not drying fast enough for me to continue on down here. Normally, if I wasn't doing this on camera, I would just let it dry on its own and I wouldn't touch that at all. But just helping to speed it on a little bit right now. Hello, newcomers. Let me know if you have any questions whatsoever about this or other random art-related things. Happy to answer them.
let's see, I'm going to mix some of this brown in with the blue. A little bit more blue. Okay, that's the color I want. What tape am I using for the paper's edge? I am just using acid-free artist tape. Artist masking tape. It comes in all colors. <laughs> I just use a narrow white one. I get people asking all the time how to tape it down and then not have it rip the paper edge when you take it off and it does it does kind of stick to the edge and so you have to be careful and you always always have to pull away from your page as you do it make sure you never you never pull it away this direction in towards your painting because that means if if anything starts to tear then it would just it would just widen that tear and and work into your painting and there's nothing worse than ripping <laughs> a finished piece. So you always want to pull downward and away. And if you leave it on for a long time, sometimes it does get more tacky and then it becomes harder to remove. Um, my advice is like if you're going to leave it on for a while before you stick it on, you just kind of pull out your tape and then like press it against your clothing so that it picks up some of the lint. <laughs> and then once you have that, then it won't attach itself so firmly to your page. All right, now this is a little bit dry. It's still mildly damp, which is fine because that will allow for some more extra blooming and textury stuff. Uh, ancient other, you say that you recently heard that tape can expire and become more likely to tear. <laughs> I was not aware of that, but I guess that doesn't surprise me. I think the glue, well, I think that, I think that's probably more likely with non-artist tape. So artist tape is going to be archival and non-archival tapes, the glue is definitely going to deteriorate and, and you can even see in like really old scotch tape it becomes kind of yellowish and gross looking <laughs> so I, I assume that that would be part of it is that just the glue itself is becoming wonky I generally don't have that problem with my pieces because I, I mostly work on just one painting, one major painting. Let's, let me amend to that uh, at a time. Uh, and by major, I mean something that's going to take longer than a week or so. Uh, so I only work on one piece like that at a time and, and I don't really have a chance for my paintings to become firmly ensconced <laughs> in whatever adhesive I've used to attach it. I love the really thin, delicate lines I can get with this paintbrush. It's really fun. This is another one of Tracy uh, Limonzon's brushes. It's a goat hair and synth synthetic blend. And it's kind of neat because it, it holds a lot of liquid 
in the the bunch of goat hair but I can still get a really fine detail point on the tip. <laughs> oh yeah, you're welcome. Here, I can link the brushes as well. Yeah, the, the two that I've been using so far here are is a uh, goat hair and synthetic blends. really satisfying to work with for this this kind of loose but delicate uh, style because I could use the same brush to do this these very broad washes you know here down at the bottom I can do stuff like that but at the same time really trail out into these wispy little bits Yeah, um, so Elmax asking if it's comfortable to hold, and yeah, it actually really is. Um, at first, I was I was a little bit skeptical about such a wide handle um, because all the little teensy tiny brushes that I use are teensy tiny, <laughs> and I I realized after I started using some of these on my botanical paintings uh, that it actually is nicer for me to grip because I don't I don't tense up as much because when it's really small and I'm doing really fine detail work I have to I, I tend to grip it tightly and it starts to strain my hands and fingers my hand gets tired doing that so these I don't have to grip as tightly because they're so they're much more substantial in their handles but they're super light because they are hollow bamboo so it's it's actually super comfortable. Uh, it's so uh, Betty Betty is that a Sumi ink brush used for Chinese calligraphy? It is not. It is made by a brush maker in Portland, and he he makes them for a number of different kinds of artists. He works with a lot of pottery artists as well. Casey Wenham says, I've heard that wider brush handles are actually better for the muscles in your wrist and hand. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that because I can even feel more relaxed with this. <laughs> It just kind of sits in my hand rather than me having to try to, try to really tighten my grip on it. to shift my lighting here a little bit. It's 
some of that can move my painting up. All right, so down here I've got some granulation going on, and so I like to let that kind of stuff dry without too much interference because if you just let it dry on its own, then you get a lot more of the speckly action happening. And if you touch it too much, then it just, you break up the granulation, the, the pigment, and then it becomes just a single tone which is fine, but it's not nearly as interesting as far as texture goes. <laughs> and if you just want single tone paints, then you can go for those. But I adore granulated, granulating pigments because I just like the richness that it gives to a piece to have that kind of texture going on. Thank you, Sarah. I'm imagining these as giant sunflower trees that go up into the clouds, <laughs> kind of like Jack and the Beanstalk, you know? So I'm going to do a little doorway down here eventually when that stuff dries a little bit more I'm going to give it a chance to do that meanwhile adding a little bit more stuff to this upper area so you remember how in the beginning I I painted the blue right in around these yellow sunflowers as they were still wet, and that's what creates this sort of yellow nimbus flowing out into the blue and this gorgeous teal color where some of those pigments mingled and mixed and bled into each other. Torneal is asking, how do I come up with ideas and what inspires you and how do you get your ideas onto paper? Well, you're watching me get the idea onto paper right now. <laughs> I, I mean, for pieces like this, I just started with the idea of sunflowers. I'm going to paint sunflowers and, and then it, it sort of evolves as I go. I feel like my pieces evolve over the course of multiple paintings and or even drawings or sketches and they go from one idea flowing out into the next one into the next one and each one is this iteration where it changes and sort of gains its own life and you know I started off with the idea of just okay I'm going to paint some sunflowers because <laughs> that's what the contest is going to be and I need a sunflower painting as part of the giveaway. And so I started doing sunflowers on the paper. You know, I started off with, with just doing stuff like this. And then, you know, I looked at this one and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. It looks like it's, it looks like a forest down here is what I'm starting to see. And I'm thinking of these as these really giant flowers in this miniature world, in this forest. And I started wanting to create other tiny little elements down there. So, you know, then that turned into this piece where there's this little house and this teeny tiny little fox. I don't know if you can even see it because it's really, really small. It's right there. That's the smallest little fox I've ever done. <laughs> and this was another evolution for it. And I started doing these shadowy tree stalks in the background as well. And here's this little tiny figure in the foreground. 
and oh yeah and then the moon over there in the sky so you know with each piece it's just sort of evolving on its own so when I do paintings like this yeah it, it's not something I really give a whole lot of thought to ahead of time but I let the piece each of the pieces you know, you know each time I'm taking my brush to my paper sort of make the decisions for me and and lead my mind down these rabbit holes so I always I always call it a s stream of consciousness in painting form it's not so much a stream of consciousness of words but it's just like one painting flows and leads on to the next one and each one sort of evolves and changes in that process now if I'm working on a much larger piece you know in a way it's it's the same kind of thing happening but on a much broader scale and one in which I spend a lot more time thinking about each of the individual components or sketches or whatever, the, 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 the steps along the way of making the painting. So I, I, don't, I don't leave it up to chance as completely as I do with something like this. If you were here from the beginning as I started painting this, this one here, you saw that I just had a blank piece of paper and I started painting the yellow sunflower discs. And from there, I'm just starting to see the shapes in this now. And I'm, I'm seeing this as, uh, I'm seeing like some of the shadow forms in the background that are much taller and I'm seeing the ground down below and I'm gonna put a little doorway down here. So it, it evolves like that. And in a way, this is going to be a stepping stone for a much larger painting, probably, because I'm now thinking that I want to do a much more thought out painting along these lines. So I'm going to take this eventually and have it as maybe the basis for my color decisions and the compositional elements. I mean, it might not be exactly like this, and it probably won't be exactly like this, but it will have parts of this that if you saw this painting being made you would recognize it in that final piece as well. I, I talk about this process that I have frequently in in the articles that I write on my Patreon so if if you aren't if you haven't seen that then you should check that out. I do have at least one free post per month that I do on my Patreon where I just kind of talk about um, you know, what I'm up to in general, and sometimes I reveal some of the background stuff that goes into paintings, but, um, you know, even for just the, the $3 a month, um, subscription, I, I start going into a lot of the behind the scenes thought process of how I come up with ideas and how a large body of work, for example, for a gallery show happens slowly in all the steps along the way that contribute to the final body of maybe, you know, 20 paintings or so. So the link for that is is in my bio on Instagram, so you can see that, but it's, you know, Patreon slash Stephanie Law. Let's see what questions I missed while I was rambling on here. <laughs> Enchanted Daydreams says, I've been thinking of this painting as a giant sunflower forest as you've been painting. Yay! So the idea came across. <laughs> Even though it's just in its beginning stages here. Nocturnial says, I have trouble getting the ideas out without butchering them. Well, that's going to be something that happens with practice and just becoming comfortable with the mediums that you choose to use, whether that's watercolor or something else. You know, it doesn't have to be watercolor. That's my chosen medium. I just enjoy the flow and the movement and the layering and the complexity of colors that are, you know, just layered on top of each other. So that's that's me, but not everyone chooses watercolor. You can choose whatever medium you like but you become familiar with it and you become you start to understand how it behaves 
Hold on. I'm going to zoom in over here because now I'm getting to finer detail stuff. So what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, about mediums. Yes. So you you start to become familiar with how your medium is going to behave and what it's going to do under certain circumstances. You know, like in the beginning when I was telling you exactly what was going to happen with those sunflowers as I dropped the the wet paint of the blue around the yellow because I have worked with watercolors now for 20 years and so I'm very familiar with how moisture levels affect the flow and how the paint's going to move and these little elements and, and so the same with any medium that you choose becoming practiced and familiar with it until it becomes less an obstacle for you for getting what's in your head out to the page is important that's that's what practice is about it's about making the the medium itself something that you can think in the language of if that makes any sense um you know you, you don't think about exactly how you're you're forming all your sentences because you just you just understand that your brain has wrapped itself around those concepts and that way of communication and so with with paint and with a medium, you know, or, or pencil or black and white or whatever you choose, your mind has to, has to really take in the process of it. And once you have that, then you can get what's in your head out to the page with less frustration. <laughs> but the other thing is, you know, before that happens, before you get to that stage, you, you just have to not be too tough on yourself and you have to be open to experimentation and to allowing the medium to show you what it does and to to do its thing because if you constantly are trying to control what happens too much then you don't let it have the opportunity to really shine and this is especially true with watercolors because watercolors really have a mind of their own sometimes <laughs> and in the way that they flow and move on a page and if you're you're frustrated with trying to micromanage exactly how that's going to result on your page then you don't give it the opportunity to showcase all its own beauty I've switched over to, um, this one is the Tracy's Stiff Synthetic Brush. And I like this one for more control. While the, the other brushes that I was using before, you know, this is the Goat Hair and Synthetic. These are great for large washes and for the more loose elements of the background. I like the, this stiff, uh, stiffer bristle, stiffer and shorter bristle for the detail close in work because that lets me really control you know I was just saying like don't try to control too much but so, sometimes you can't uh, it lets me control the pigment a lot better for techniques like dry brush Shay's, Shay So Forgetful asks, uh, your work is always so beautiful, how do you keep everything so organic? Part of letting the paint do its thing is, is what allows the piece to be organic. You have to let chance play a part in the work because if you, if you try to control every little element, then our minds can't really create 
that kind of randomness. And, and, th and there, is some, there is some element of controlling to create organic shapes and forms, and that's where aesthetic uh, and your artist's mind comes in because your personal vision for art is what's going to create the aesthetic for the piece. And I enjoy a lot of organic shapes and forms. I enjoy nature and the curves and movements that you find in nature and in natural things. And so I try to emulate that a lot in the crafted portions of my paintings. And so, yeah, it's, it, it comes from taking in your surroundings and, and really searching for the organic flow and movement of things all around you. Zion Alfredi Zion says, I enjoy reading your book. Thank you very much. I'm so glad you enjoy it. Have you done any paintings from it also? Uh, I don't know if you're still here, Betty, but thank you for stopping in. And you, you can watch this later in my IGTV. I'll have it archived over there. And I've been doing these um, for the past couple months, every Monday. Time has shifted around a little bit, but I think the most recent time slot has been for this and, and the previous few times, 6 p.m. on Monday night Pacific time. So you can tentatively mark your calendars for that if you want to participate and, and watch the next time I'm doing live streaming as well. So I guess the next one would be, let's see, today's the 22nd, so the 29th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, Monday. Joanna Roll says it's perfect for Western Australia, too. <laughs> Great. What time is it over there? <laughs> You'd think that after all this time I could figure out what time it is on the other side of the world, but I just never remember. <laughs> all I know is that whatever time I pick, someone, someone somewhere in the world says I can't do that time, so I just kind of shift it around every once in a while and pick times that, that work for me. Uh, yeah, so for those that those of you that just popped in more recently, I sort of mentioned this at the beginning, but I think most of you all have forgotten because there was only a blank piece of paper at the time that I first mentioned it before. But this painting will be part of a contest prize, this original painting. So if you would like to win this piece, 
along with this little mini cute set of artistic aisle paints as well as a bunch of other little goodies that Lindsay has put together in a giveaway kit then I, I will post information about it after this video is over on my Instagram so check for it there but it's essentially it's a sunflower painting contest and anyone who wants to can enter with a little sunflower painting of your own and there will be six winners that are helping sponsor this alongside Artistic Isle. And you have until next weekend, I believe. Is that right, Lindsay? She's in the chat here. <laughs> I think it's next Sunday. So yeah, if you would like to give this little sunflower painting a home, be sure to check that out. So I keep building up the color in these deep shadowed areas by painting in the negative space around these vines. And each time I go in there, I, I do a smaller little segment area. So that's what creates this illusion of depth of multiple layers of vines and tangled branches receding back. And this is the other secret about watercolor. Well, not really a secret, it's the key to watercolor, is that you push the shadows back with successive layers versus acrylic and oils or any of the additive light additive uh, mediums where you can build your light areas and pull those up out of your painting. For example, if you were painting a face, you start with painting all the shadows and under layers and then you slowly layer lighter colors and skin tones on top of that to pull and sculpt the face out of the shadows that you create. So that, that's how it works with um, an, an opaque pigment. So gouache and acrylic and oils, all of those work that way. Whereas with watercolors, it's the opposite. Now, with the exception of the little white doorway over here that I used opaque white for, everything else in this piece, if you've watched as I created it, happens to push the dark areas back and back and back with each successive bit of color that I add. For example, I started with the golden flowers, which are a light highlight area. But from there on, everything else, all this background stuff, you, you've noticed I kept going back to them. I keep going back to them and adding more color, more richness, more depth to those tones so that eventually they, they feel like they are 
farther back than the bright yellow of the flowers. And same with these shadows here around the doorway. The lightest parts are the places that I touched the least, where I only had a little bit of interaction with pigment and my brush and page. And the rest of it is stuff that, you know, I'm still painting and working on and, and pushing further and further back into the shadow depths. getting towards the end of the hour here and it looks like I'm actually getting towards the end of this painting too. I wasn't sure if I would have a chance to finish the whole thing within the hour but I was able to move fast enough. I'm mixing some more of the blue and the scarlet hematite to get some really intense dark tones just to add some more trailing little bits over here in the foreground. You see the the top portion of this so you know I start on the top and then I, I pull my brush down into the wet areas and that lets the paint flow and spread into the wet part while the top remains very fine and delicate because that is being painted onto dry surface Top off with a little bit of golden pigment, dotting that in wet and wet so that it spreads a little bit and adds a little bit of gleaming shine down here. And water helps to let it flow. There we go. And a few little pinpoint wisps. This is just a, a white gel pen that I'm using. done now. So if anyone has any final questions before I wrap this up, uh, if not then I'll see everyone next week, next Monday again at 6 p.m. Pacific time.
we go. That's the finished piece. And here's all the stuff that I used for it. Let's see, there's those two brushes and my gel pens. Thanks so much for joining me and come hang out with me again next week.